Well, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you, I guess, or at least tell you the rules of the road in antitrust. Uh, I noticed in the program that uh, Web Squared is about harnessing the power of the web for positive change. And the way I think of our mission uh, in antitrust enforcement is to make sure that those companies, individuals, uh, who want to make that change happen are not blockaded, are enabled, uh, with our underlying belief that competition is, is a tremendous driver and engine of economic growth. Uh, I've been studying these issues for quite a while, as, as was mentioned, uh, normally a professor at UC Berkeley. Some of you may know my book with Hal Varian, Information Rules, A Strategic Guide to the Network Economy. Well, now Hal is a chief economist at Google, and I'm the chief economist at the uh, Justice Department Antitrust Division. So we, um, we're still good friends, but there's quite a few things we can't talk about anymore. Um, uh, let, me, let me give a, I want to give a quick overview of some of the areas of antitrust and really how I think it applies to, to the technology sector and the web in particular. You know, even the term antitrust is, it's really a 19th century term. Uh, the Sherman Act, our, our main statute, is, is 1890, so that's also 19th century. But I prefer to think in terms of competition policy uh, rather than the somewhat more older term of antitrust. The philosophy uh, behind antitrust is that uh, we that the competitive process is what we want to protect, the, the competition between firms. And that does not mean uh, leading to any particular outcome. Uh, if a single firm is victorious and gains a dominant position based on offering low prices and superior product quality, then the competitive process has worked just fine. Uh, the, the famous antitrust enforcer, Thurmond Arnold, who ran the antitrust division uh, back in the 1930s and the early 40s, uh, likened the, the role of antitrust to that of the uh, referee in a boxing match, whose job is to make sure the fight is fair, but not to handicap winners or prop up the losers. So now this, how does this philosophy get implemented? Uh, well, there are three, three primary areas where competition policy plays. Uh, monopolization, and then um, mergers, and then agreements among competitors. And I'm going to quickly dash through each of those with some examples. So in terms of uh, monopolization, or what the Europeans call abuse of dominance, the basic idea is a dominant firm, a, very, a, a strong, powerful firm, needs to play fair. Exclusionary or predatory conduct are illegal. Uh, this, to give another sports analogy, we would say we want the fastest uh, runner on the track to win the race, not the guy who trips up another runner. And this is our Sherman Act, uh, as I said, 1890. Now, I often get a lot of mis misunderstanding about this. It's not a law prohibiting having a dominant position or even a monopoly position in a market if that is earned fair and square. It, so the, the illegal act under the statute is monopolization, some conduct that is regarded as exclusionary or predatory. Now there's a lot of uh, talk about this, uh, but the fact is the antitrust division in the last 25 years has brought 15 uh, monopolization cases. Over a longer sweep of time, some of these cases have been extremely important. Uh, the Standard Oil breakup of 100 years ago is noted. The AT&T breakup of 25 years ago, you know, a lot closer to us in time and space in terms of its tremendous impact on the telecom sector. Uh, and of course, we have the more recent case, 1998, probably the last big one you've heard of, that would be the Microsoft case. There were two more in 1999 in, in different sectors, one in the airline industry and the other involving, um, get this, the dominant provider of artificial teeth. Okay. Uh, no, that, that's true. Um, but these legal principles can be, can be developed in, in any sector of the economy. Uh, in May of this year, uh, the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, Christine Varney, that being my boss, she, she gave a speech indicating that the Antitrust Division would be taking a more active role in policing uh, Sherman Act uh, monopolization. Uh, and we are. And as I said, this, we see this as a pro-innovation mission to ensure that those who are challenging the status quo, very often smaller players, are not excluded or blocked from the market. The other thing I'd note on um, abuse of dominance is that one does need to pay attention to the European Commission. Uh, they've had Microsoft in their sights for, um, for most of this decade, and they just recently uh, hit Intel with a fine of a billion uh, euros, which is big money. Uh, and I won't be talking about European Commission actions as such. Uh, second area is mergers. Uh, basically, uh, it is a violation of our antitrust laws for two companies to merge 
if they are significant competitors and if that will substantially lessen competition as a result of the merger. Uh, this uh, is probably the area of antitrust enforcement that uh, has the most direct and immediate impact on a lot of businesses. Uh, upwards of a trillion dollars of M&A activity gets uh, reported. Uh, and any deal over about $65 million has to be reported to the uh, Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department. And then we get a chance to look at those. Uh, in, in last year, there were about uh, 1,600 deals that got reported to us. We only opened investigations in 70 of those deals. So what's that, a few percent? Uh, and took enforcement actions in less than 1% of the deals, just 14. So uh, this is basically, uh, everybody's on notice about how this works. We have detailed guidelines uh, that tell the business community uh, how we do the analysis. It's very fact specific, depends on the deal. Uh, these guidelines date to 1992, and we just announced um, about a month ago that we're gonna be looking into revising them, updating them. Uh, I'm involved in that effort, and we, we've invited public comments on doing that. Uh, I won't get into specific cases, but just to give you a couple of examples, Probably one of the, the more visible um, examples in uh, the last uh, five years or so was the Justice Department's challenge of Oracle's acquisition of PeopleSoft. Uh, that one, DOJ lost, so the merger went through. Um, currently, uh, one of the probably the most visible tech deal that I can think of is, is uh, Oracle seeking to acquire Sun. And that one, we, um, we actually completed our investigation in August, but it's still being looked at by the European Commission. Okay. These, these merger issues can also come up uh, with partial ownership, um, and our guidelines provide, um, I think, uh, that's a good place to look to see how we do it. Uh, the other area I'd mention, there's always hardcore cartels and price fixing, but to see that, figure that out, go see the, uh, the movie The Informant, okay? Uh, that, that, that'll tell you about it. Um, the other area I think is terribly important in your space is collaboration of various sorts. Uh, I'm a huge believer in the value, the critical value of collaboration. And very often there's concern or unease about collaborating with other companies because of antitrust fears that go back to really the 19th century, and early 20th century, price fixing, uh, and your lawyers will all, you know, can get freaked out by that. Uh, we have guidelines regarding collaboration, and many types of collaboration are uh, perfectly fine. The basic test is, are you collaborating, meeting with, with rivals to uh, achieve some pro-competitive end in terms of better uh, better prices, better pr quality products. A very big area here is, is standard setting, uh, and uh, we've, we've issued a series of uh, advice in the form of business review letters and other statements in explaining how it's quite legitimate and valuable for companies not only to in engage in standard setting, which many of you do all the time, but also to, uh, to deal with patent issues. The intersection between patents and standards is quite a bit of a mess and can cause a lot of trouble, as many standard setting organizations have learned. And uh, we've issued a series of these business review letters indicating that it's perfectly acceptable for standard setting organizations to take actions so that their members in implementing the standard are protected from subsequent patent challenges uh, and so that patents can be licensed on fair and reasonable terms and they're disclosed. Various rules that standard development organizations can set are, uh, we've, we've tried to clear the field so that uh, companies can experiment with those, with those methods so they can um, set up st standards and, and help move technology forward in that way. Thank you very much.